So, Yuri asked me to introduce myself a little bit more. So, um, I started to work in the Department of Molecular Biology, Faculty of Science, uh, 92, and I was working on plants for 20 years. So, maybe before eight years, I shifted on uh, humans. I introduced epigenetics on my department. I have a group of uh, 10 people, thanks to two uh, European grants, and we are working uh, on epigenetics of glycosylation in human diseases. And uh, firstly, I will talk about uh, some general things in epigenetics. I will explain you about some epigenetic phenomena. I will um, explain you which are the epigenetic mechanisms, how they are established, how they are inherited, and then I will show you how epigenetics can be also uh, adaptory mechanism uh, and uh, uh, how it can be transmitted uh, through gametes to ne uh, next generations and be a substrate to evolution. And uh, at the very end of my talk, I will present you some of the work that we are doing uh, in my group. So if you uh, want to stop me at any moment, just please stop me and ask questions. So uh, epigenetics was firstly recognized by developmental biologists because uh, they noticed that um, we have uh, very different phenotypes of the cell types. Uh, they very soon realized that we have uh, uh, the, the same, uh, same genetic information in every cell and it was obvious that something is going on to differentiate cells to another to different phenotypes. But they didn't understand what is this, what define different phenotypes of different cells of any organism, multicellular organism. And I will talk mostly about people. So uh, there was even in 60s uh, last century, there was uh, one scientist who proposed that it must be some bio simple biochemical pathway which can establish uh, one gene state switched on gene state, which means gene uh, expression, and another gene state which is switched off gene state, means silencing, and that these two states must be stable. Uh, and actually, this is a uh, very important and uh, principal concept of, ep of epigenetics. So, uh, the years that preceded, um, there was a very many uh, research done and uh, which, is, uh, which um, uh, enabled development of ep epigenetics, but uh, one thing that really put epigenetic on the scene was a sequence of the human genome. Why is that? And sequences of the sequencing of the genomes of other model organisms. Why is that? Because uh, we were all very excited about sequencing of the human genome because we thought that we will know a lot of about uh, which genes cause which disease, that we will enable better treatments, therapies, but it didn't happen. Why it didn't happen? Because only what we learned was sequences. We were overwhelmed with letters, but uh, fundamental questions were not answered. So, at this moment, it was sure that uh, there is something that we must learn about us to explain us this uh, huge gap between uh, this uh, fact that only 5% of the uh, human diseases are due to single gene mutations. The rest of the majority of population have a genetic setup which enable us for a long, healthy life. But, as you know, a lot of people are not healthy. The majority of people have some complex diseases that are treated all their life, they suffer, and they die before they should die. So, there is a big gap between this genetic mutation and the disease. Uh, so, we cannot explain this uh, majority of human population suffering from uh, complex diseases, diseases with the bad genes. Uh, 
So when we sequence human genomes, we learned that human genom genome is composed of some uh, 25,000 of genes distributed on 23 chromosomes, but this is only less than 2% of the human genome. The rest are repetitive DNAs. Firstly, in 60s, last century, they called this junk DNA or parasite DNA, but now we know that it is not. Non-coding DNA, most of non-coding DNA is transcribed and this uh, non-coding RNAs that is a product, product of the transcription uh, are uh, very much in function, uh, in a genome function and it represents one of the epigenetic mechanisms. So these 25,000 uh, 2,500 genes are distributed like a, in biblioteca of different books. So, we have a different set of books, we have a different chapters, different phrases, different words, and how we will know which gene at which, which time, uh, in which uh, cell uh, must be active, and how we will find this gene, and how we will activate this gene. So, we must take, we must know which page in these books it will be read at the proper time and how it is, uh, how we can determine this. Well, we have a beautiful indexing system and this is chromatin. I consider that chromatin is the most fascinating structure in the eukaryotic cells. So firstly, do you know how long is a human DNA? in each, every cell of an organism. Two meters, two meters. So you must pack two meters of DNA into micrometer small nucleus. And this is achieved by a very smart invention of nucleosome wrapping. So there is a two wrap of DNA uh, around the nucleo nucleosome, octameric core. So there are uh, eight histones here. Then it, this, is a first, uh, uh, this is the first level of packing the chromatin. Then you have a hexamer uh, of nucleosomes that is called solenoid. Then it is coiled to a higher order chromatin structure. And then you achieve maximal compaction that is interphase or metaphase chromosome. So when DNA is packed like this, how you will enable, for example, transcriptional machinery to find a promoter of certain gene, sit in the promoter and start to transcribe the gene. It must be some indexing system that allow these enzymes to find a promoter. So this indexing system is provided by chromatin and the modifications of chromatin, which are epigenetic uh, modifications. These modifications can be modification in DNA itself. So only modification of DNA molecule is a addition of a methyl group to cytosine. So it's a DNA methylation. Or uh, there are covalent addition of uh, different groups such as methyl group, acetyl group, phosphate group to uh, histone cells. You can see here one nucleosome and this, uh, these are histone cells and this uh, blue, uh, red and green circles, these are modification of uh, histone tails on a histone octamer. Uh, also, third epigenetic mechanism is uh, action of non-coding RNAs. What do they do? They put enzymes which put modifications on DNA or histone tails to the right place. So it's, for me, it's a very fascinating mechanism. You have a, a one part of the genome, non-coding part, repetitive, repetitive part, which is transcribed to non-coding RNAs, which are going to the same place where they were transcribed in order to silence this part of the genome. Um, <clears throat> so we can say that epigenetic mechanisms and modifications tell the genome how to behave. What we must know that all these three epigenetic mechanisms 
uh, though there are six of them, but I'm talking about three of them because they're the most important. I mean, the most important because we can study them. Uh, they are interrelated and they reinforce each other in orchestration of a normal cell development. So, proper epigenetic information is needed for proper transcription, DNA replication, DNA repair recombination, and the differentiation. And if something goes wrong here, if you have aberrant epigenetic information, you will end up with the disturbed homeostasis and development of uh, cancer or other complex diseases. So, uh, in establishment of epigenetic information, there are three kinds of, three types of enzymes that are important. Um, so, I will just uh, call them as types of uh, enzymes. First types are called writers. What are writers? These are enzymes that put modifications to DNA or histone tails, like DNA methyltransferase, histone methyltransferases, histone acetylases, uh, then, or kinases, which put phosphate to histone tails. Then readers, these are very exotic um, enzymes and proteins, which can recognize uh, modification, like a pet methyl cytosine is recognized by uh, methyl binding uh, proteins, MBD proteins, or uh, modifications has, uh, these uh, enzymes, writers, has domains that are called bromodomains or chromodomains. Bromodomain is associated with gene silencing, uh, gene activation and chromodomain is associated with gene silencing. So these readers recognize these domains on writers and tell them what to do, okay? Recruit some other enzymes to the place where chromatin should be more condensed, co condensed or more opened. And the th third type of uh, enzymes are erasers. So these are enzymes which put off modifications from DNA or from histone tails. So these are histone deacetylases. Um, uh, there are demethylases of uh, methylation in, on histones. And for DNA methylation, there is no one enzyme that put off methyl group from cytosine. There is uh, this TET protein. It's a quite new thing. So. Uh, methylation is uh, transformed from um, pet methyl cytosine to hippo uh, methyl cytosine, then, to, then it is demethylated. It's a little bit complicated uh, pathway. Uh, so, of course, if you have a mutation or SNP in, this, in genes for these enzymes, you will have a biological outcome. It will be reflected on gen epigenetic information. So you see here that genetics and epigenetics are interrelated. And the hardcore geneticists don't believe in epigenetics. They, can, they say, yes, everything is in genetics, because if you have a mutation in a gene for these enzymes, then you will have an epigenetic change. But it's not like this. I will now, in the rest of my talk, convince you it's not only genetic mutation that uh, change epigenetic information. So uh, in this slide, I will just explain you how uh, how this state switch on state associated with activity, switch off state associated with silencing uh, is achieved or it is uh, shifted one in another. So if you have a, a more open chromatin, this is because uh, the, the most important modification here is acetylation. Why? Because DNA is negatively, negatively charged acetylated group are positively charged and then if it is acetylated this genome uh, region you have um, a more relaxed uh, bound between DNA and histones and you will have here a uh, switched on state you will have more relaxed uh, chromatin here you, you can see here this green this is a linker DNA and the promoter or sequence that should be recognized by in initial uh, complex should be exposed. Initial complex can be bound and then 
you have a RNA polymerase that comes and transcription is going on. Uh, if DNA methylase put methyl, uh, methyl groups on cytosine on a DNA molecule, then this will be a signal, this is a so-called transitional state, a signal uh, for MBD proteins, so these are these interpreters, uh, MBD protein recognized methyl group and recruits other machinery, these writers, that will put necessary modification to transform active and more open to condense and repressed uh, state. So, uh, MBD protein is recruiting histone methyl transferase, uh, histone deacetylase. Once histone deacetylase put off acetyl group from H3K9, K9 is lysine uh, on the position 9 on histone tails, Immedi immediately at this place histone methyl transferase is putting methyl group. And uh, then there are accum accumulation of other modification and you have a more condensed state, initiation complex cannot bound and the transcription is stopped. So, epigenetic modification affects gene expression by providing differential access to proteins of the transcriptional machinery. Uh, of course, uh, now you understand how important it is that uh, correct epigenetic modifications uh, are transmitted from cell to cell. We call, we call this uh, epigenetic memory. Uh, and epigenetic inheritance is mostly um, mean, means inheritance from cell to cell through mito uh, mitosis, not through me meiosis. You will see later why. So uh, this uh, correct propagation of uh, info, uh, DNA methylation uh, is doing DNA methylase, uh, DNA methyl transferase one or maintenance methyl transferase. Uh, its subs substrate is hemimethylated DNA. So this is the information for this enzyme and you have a, a correct methylation. This is all happening during replication. I don't know... <laughs> <laughs> My students um, that are on the second uh, year of and listening genetics, um, they learn still replication in terms of uh, learning how RNA polymerase is replicating DNA. They never heard that in replication for, uh, forks there is other enzymes such as DNA methyl transferase 1, um, histone chaperones because histone modification must be propagated faithfully also. So in a replication for, fork you have a uh, lot of enzymes, not only RNA polymerase, which are establishing correct chromatin state. Uh, either on hemimethylated DNA on, or um, in the, there is also nucleosomes here and some of the histones never go into the nuclear pool. They always say, uh, stay inside nucleosomes. Why? They must here serve as an information for correct propagation of the histone modifications on newly synthesized chain. Okay? So this is a cellular memory. Uh, and here I would like to stress that there are two uh, main roles of, for epigenetics. This is so-called predetermined epigenetics. This is what I just explained you. Um, <clears throat> assembly of uh, special transcription factors and specific epigenetic information uh, enable differentiation of the cell to different cell types. So we have, we have a human specific genome, one genome, but we have a lot of epigenomes. Uh, the number is equivalent to a cell types of an organism. So we have something like uh, uh, 200 different cell types. So we have uh, 200 different epigenomes. Uh, but uh, I'm much more fascinated on, in this probabilistic epigenetics. And what is this? Probabilistic, so this predetermined epigenetics means unidirectional 
um, process. You have a genome, then epigenetic information is establishing a specific epigenome of the each cell. But probabilistic epigenetics means bidirectional uh, relationship between structure and function and gene and environment. So uh, <coughs> epigenetic uh, gen uh, genotype and the genome can be influenced by envi environmental factors. Either uh, those from outside, external, or our, uh, our environment in our, ourselves, intrinsic environment. So, uh, how? Through epigenetic mechanisms. Susceptibility to uh, environment is determined by genotypes. So, it's a, it's a uh, it's, um, reciprocal uh, relationship. So, uh, in adult life, we have established epigenetic information, but epigenetic information is plastic and dynamic. It can respond to environment, environmental factors. It can be changed and it is reversible. It can be changed and it can be uh, reversibly, it can be reversed to a normal state. But some of the changes even in adult life can stay permanently and I will show you today how it is possible. Uh, if you compare histone modifications and DNA methylation, DNA methylation is much more rigid uh, epigenetic mark. It can, uh, it, is, it can be changed through adult life but it, it is um, uh, uh, more difficultly changed and if it is changed can be reversal but can stay for whole life. And histone modifications are very dynamic. They can change even in 15 minutes in response to stress. 15 minutes. Also, I didn't tell you about uh, one epigenetic mechanism. This is uh, histone variants. So you have uh, H2, uh, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. But they can be changed in some genome regions by different uh, histone variants, which also are signals for gene activity, gene repression, gene repair. Okay. Uh, because of the probabilistic epigenetics, we have a lot of inter-individual variability in the population. Uh, so variability that we saw between us is not just a genotype; it's also uh, also. Uh, epigenotype, epigenetics, and this is very nicely shown in studies uh, uh, performed on monozygotic twins, which are genetically identical. Um, and uh, there is a very nice paper, even it, now it is already old, 2005, but it's, it's a really a uh, paper that is uh, cited everywhere. And uh, in this paper, um, uh, authors showed that they were examining 60 pairs of monozygotic twins. They were examining methylation and histone modifications when these monozygotic twins were babies, little ones, children, and later in life, during life. And what we saw, what they saw then <coughs> when uh, twins were little, they show no or very small epigenetic differences, and when they grow, grow up, they accumulate epigenetic differences. And this is response to environment. Uh, and uh, there is uh, one group that we are collaborating with, it's a Tim Spector's group. He is working on a uh, in a King's College in London. He has uh, one of the biggest reg twin registry in the world. He has a uh, 1,100 twins and all the quantitative genetic traits for them and uh, he contributed a lot in understanding of the complex diseases by studies performed on twins. Uh, by the way, this, uh, Tim Spector was also one of the author in this, in this uh, paper which is cited always for this kind of uh, <coughs> studies. Uh, so. As I said, epigenetic, uh, aberrant epigenetic 
uh, changes are accumulating through life in response to environment. And in fact, today we know we are all obsessed with cancer. We all want to uh, discover uh, therapies uh, for cancer, want to understand mechanism for cancer, but cancer is, uh, I, I think, I don't know uh, exactly which percentage, but, but um, very small amount of this cake is um, uh, for each of type of the cancer is uh, provoked by mutations. So if you have a mutation in a gene, you, you know that you probably you will have a cancer. All uh, the rest uh, cases for, of cancer uh, arise spontaneously, stochastically during life. Uh, we say cancer is a, a illness of old people. This is a price for our uh, long lives. Why is that? Because of epigenetics, because we accumulate a lot of aberrant epigenetic changes and it, is, it has been shown that in virtually every phase of tum tumor uh, you can find epigenetic changes in genes, of course, which are associated with this type of uh, tumor or any type of tumor and these are tumor, tumor suppressor genes, genes involved in DNA repair, involved in apoptosis, etc. And even it is fascinating that you can um, that you can have a methylation in some promoters of some genes as an early diagnostic marker before the appearance of sy sy uh, symptoms uh, for, for cancer. And uh, today we know that cancer is mostly a uh, disease of epigene disturbed epigenetic information and if you, you know this Knudsen hi hypothesis, no? So, uh, Knudsen hypothesis say that uh, it must be a first hit during early embryonic development. So you have a high heterozygous mutation and during the life, if you acquire another mutation, you will end up with the aberrant expression of the key gene and you will have a malignant transformation. But second hit uh, should not only be mutation, but it's uh, much rather uh, epigenetic change. And what we know, know today that the first hit in many cancer is epigenetic change. And the second hit is again epigenetic change. Quick question. Why would epigen uh, occur a, a epigenetic modification in one chromosome and not in another if it's environmental? If as, it a is? as a second hit, yes. this, uh, the genetic modification occurs in one chromosome, but not in the other? Is there yeah, like a, a mutation. Mm. Yes, of course, like a mutation. But uh, you, you don't, you very, very, very rarely you have a homozygous mutation. You have more often heterozygous mutation. It's a, a more, a less chance that you will have a mutation at the two, two homologous chromosome. Uh, at the same time. So it's random uh, modification. Yes. Yes. Uh, and here I will just before I go to to uh, to um, story which uh, factors are affecting uh, our epigenetic information. I will just give you here one uh, proposal that uh, me and my postdoc uh, were published in 2013. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, his idea. Uh, he said that, in fact, uh, cancer is a continuous adapta epigenetic adaptation on permanent stress. So if you have some kind of stress, so this is presented like a chip, you have a uh, change in expression of some genes in order to uh, establish again your homeostasis. Then uh, some, if you stress is prolonged, if the stress is prolonged, then some cells will go to apoptosis, but these ones that escape from apoptosis and continue to accumulate 
uh, this change in gene expression, we'll end up with the very many genes that change uh, expression. And even if this is an uh, adaptation to, uh, to achieve how homeostasis, at one moment it can turn to malignant transformation. So you can see cancer as a permanent try of the cell to uh, preserve homeostasis, change uh, gene activity uh, by changing epigenetic information, methylation, and then finally uh, cell can end up in malignant transformation. So which uh, factors are uh, affecting our epigenetic information? There are uh, scientific uh, uh, experimental uh, uh, proofs that uh, these are nutrition, toxins, uh, chemicals, smoking, alcohol intake, uh, uh, heavy metals, ion and UV radiation, etc. But also stress and behavior. And I will just quickly show you uh, two, uh, uh, several examples for that. Well, it is very important to say that these uh, environmental um, factors, if they act on the genome, on the mother when she is pregnant, it will really change the information of the fetus. Why? Because at that time, it is, uh, epigenetic information is mo uh, mostly vulnerable because it has been being established at that time. So if you, uh, if you uh, have a, some effect on the environment, at the time it has been established, it can be aberrantly established. Uh, so timing is everything. Uh, and uh, epigenetics uh, link mom's environment and baby's environment in the thumb to a baby's biology, which will persist during whole baby's life. And it will not be changed. You will have a permanent result of the mother's environment during a lifetime. So be careful when you are pregnant. <laughs> no, really. Nutrition really affects baby's uh, epigenetic inf in information. Uh, why? There is a very simple biochemical explanation for this. Uh, your methyl group for DNA methylation and histomethylation comes from your metabolism. S adenosyl methionine is uh, uh, the uh, main donor for methyl groups. It comes from your metabolic pathways, but also it comes from food. So uh, pregnant women are uh, often recommended to take folate, fol uh, folate acid, uh, folic acid uh, in, uh, as a food supplement, or to eat some uh, food which are rich in choline, beta and beta, uh, B vitamin, etc. Uh, also, some chemicals like phytoestrogens, which you will find uh, in soya, uh, some pesticides, and uh, bisphenol A, you know, where you have a lot of bisphenol A and you are using this every day. Plastic, plastic bottles, yeah, water plastic bottles. Uh, so these uh, chemicals can alter epigenetic information because it interferes with the uh, metabolic pathway of uh, S-adenosyl methionine. So there is a very nice uh, example in the animal world how uh, nutrition can uh, link pheno phenotype through epigenetic mechanisms. So uh, in uh, honeybees, you know that workers and queens are genetically completely identical. But what determines that uh, some uh, larva will become worker or queen, it, uh, it, uh, this is determined by uh, by nutrition, um, larvae that are fed with the royal jelly, this is a very complex protein, uh, um, which can change methylation level of some genes. So uh, if larvae eats royal jelly, this will turn off DNA met methyl transferase and some genes which are needed to uh, for ovarian development, uh, uh, behavior of queens, which is different from workers, will be turned on 
and larva will develop in queen and not in a, wor on, in a worker. So you can see a very direct example, example of uh, nutrition and uh, uh, phenotype through epigenetic mechanisms. Also, there is uh, one uh, example of um, mouse in mouse. It's an epigenetic nutrition model. Uh, so uh, this mouse is normal. It's uh, a goatee mouse, has um, brown hair, and this mouse is uh, the same strain, but this yellow color is uh, determined by a recessive allele. But as you can see, it's not just the color that differentiates these two mouse. This mouse is uh, obese, and it is uh, very susceptible to uh, diseases such as tumors uh, and cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. And you can also see that in the population you have uh, multiple alleles, uh, which result in a variegation of phenotype. And here you can see methylation. Why, uh, what is this? That means that uh, allele which uh, determine brown uh, hair is uh, one, uh, or better start with yellow one. Uh, the yellow one is um, because uh, mobile elements, altier retrotransposons, are activated. They insert it in the promoter of the gene, which um, determine yellow core, but not only in these genes, but also uh, this altier uh, mobile element uh, inserts ectopically in all tissues and interrupt the right expression of genes, and then you have this result. And if altier is suppressed by methylation, then you have a normal mouse. And uh, the phenotype depends on the level of the methylation of this altier element. And it's nice to see that if you fe feed two mouse mothers, which are pregnant, one mother is uh, fed with the mouse food, uh, normal mouse food, and in the food is added bisphenol A, which interfere with the metabolism of methionine, you will end up with pups which are yellow and uh, fat and ill. And if uh, another mother was uh, uh, given bisphenol A, but it was, uh, uh, she was fed with a food rich in choline, betaine, and other donors of methyl groups, they will have a normal poops. So you can see that you can really overcome the effect of the chemicals by uh, giving them uh, more methyl groups, yes. Uh, is it because, you know, the environment changes while fat is development? Or is it because somehow methylation passes this barrier when uh, meiosis occurs? No, because uh, you feed a mother with a chemical which uh, interferes no, metabolic... I mean, you have some kind of methylation in these cells before they turn into... Ah, yeah, yeah. Because at that time you have an establishment of methylation pattern, and if you yeah yeah uh, normally at that time methylation pattern is established. If you interfere with something, you can achieve aberrant methylation pattern. Ah no, you will see now this. I will explain you this. I know what you mean. So uh, another, uh, this, this, is, this was also an example of how chemicals can influence epigenetic information. And another example is uh, that some uh, chemical uh, interfere with DNA methyltransferase, histone deacetylase is another enzymes. And uh, some of these chemicals are used as anti-tumor uh, drugs. They are approved by uh, uh, FDA, uh, such as uh, Zebulahin, uh, five aza cited in uh, five aza two deoxycytidine, in which are inhibitors of methyl transferases, and uh, Saha, which is inhibitor of histone deacetylases. They are used to treat tumors. And here you can see a large uh, tumor of the brain. And after epigenetic treatment, you have uh, you, you see uh, considerably decreased uh, tumor mass 
Of course, these are very um, unspecific treatments, but also like cytostatics and everything else. Um, so this, this shows you that epigenetic information is reversible. You can change methylation, you will end up with cancer, but you can again change it, change it and restore normal gene expression. How be, so it's very easy to imagine how food or chemicals can change methylation, but how, how behavior can change methylation? It's a little bit more alternative, sounds more alternative. But there is a very nice uh, epigenetic rat model. Uh, in a normal uh, rat neonatal uh, development, it's very important that mother are grooming and licking their pups. And if uh, they're doing this, you have a normal development. And these uh, pups are normal, quiet, uh, they behave normally. But if mothers are not doing licking and grooming, then a uh, pup is developing in, in very aggressive and nervous rat. It seems like it is genetic, but it's not, it's epigenetic. Uh, it, is, uh, it is about methylation on glucocorticosteroid receptor, which is involved in a stress re response. So you have a, so this, I will just show you very simply because uh, I don't know a lot about stress biochemical pathways. So uh, hippocampus is, um, sending a sig stress signal to pituitary gland, then to the adrenaline gland, then adrenaline gland is uh, secreting cortisol, cortisol is going back to hippocampus, and normally, if you have a glucocorticosteroid receptors, uh, this is a signal uh, for hypothalamus to stop this stress circuit. But in these pups, which were not uh, properly nurtured, uh, there is uh, no this uh, glucocorticosteroid protein and you have a continuous constitutive stress signal stress circuit. But it can be reversed if you inject to an aggressive and anxious rate injection of a DNA methyltransferase inhibitor, you can achieve normal calm pup and vice versa if you inject to a, a normal uh, uh, pup uh, injection of methyl groups you will end up with methylated this gene and you will have a anxious um, rat. So you can see which a nice example of um, linking stress behavior. So it's not pups, it's not their behavior or their information, it's mothers uh, behavior which will change their information. Uh, so you see, uh, this is just what I already told you that epigenetic information is very dynamic and gives a genome which is rigid uh, some kind of plasticity. You can change gen epigenetic information, you can restore it. It's very dynamic. Uh, and uh, with this behavioral uh, story, we come to this old question, nature or nurture, what is more important? Here I gave you a little, uh, yes, a joke. <laughs> so, um, I was used to believe that everything is genetics when I see my sons. They are, they, I, I can say that it's genetics, but mm -hmm. I think that epigenetics has also a huge role. Uh, so in science you have always some people who are visionaries. They see things before others and mostly they are not recognized by scientific community. They are mostly rejected and uh, like uh, Barbara McClintock and uh, one of uh, such a men was, uh, is Bruce Lipton, who was a professor on uh, Wisconsin's University. He was a developmental biologist and he was doing research in Stanford. But um, he was not understood because he said 
we are not determined by our genes. There are some proteins that can change the uh, state of our genes and uh, we can act on our genes by our emotions and thoughts. And he was uh, looked as very alternative uh, uh, freak. But today there are a lot of, uh, not voodoo voodoo uh, quasi research, but really well designed uh, serious research, which is uh, published in very, very serious scientific uh, journals, that shows that uh, there is a that uh, there is a link between behavior and uh, epigenetics, and it's uh, very easily to explain because a uh, lot of uh, lot of uh, metabolic um, metabolic um, molecules from metabolic pathways are substrates for uh, enzymes which are uh, writers and erasers, writers. Uh, so also neurotransmitters that are, um, that, uh, that are produced by our brain is also uh, uh, responding to physiologi uh, physiological variation and uh, with this phys physiological variation, with, with these neurotransmitters, we can modulate chromatin state and control gene expression. Um, and uh, here I come to, um, so now you can really be convinced that what our mother eat or think, it will have an effect on a baby. But uh, do our grandparents have effect on us? Yes, they, they can have an effect on us. How that, how, how they can have an effect on us. So there's a very nice example from the Second World War. It was at the end of the, of the Second World War. I don't know if you heard about Dutch famine. Probably older here in the room heard about this. Uh, so uh, in the Netherlands, there was a very, very uh, big blockade. Uh, Germans blocked uh, food and fuel from the agricultural parts. So uh, something like 4.5 billion of, pe of people were cut off the food. 2,200 people died. But these ones that survived Dutch famine, uh, women who survived Dutch famine, if they were pregnant at that time, they gave a birth to a low um, birth weighted babies. And what is mo more in interesting that these people, these babies in adult life show high incidence of cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. And uh, researchers uh, were examining methylation in some uh, key genes in women and men that experience famine in utero and find considerable differences uh, comparing to normal population. And what is more interesting that the grandchildren, so children of these um, woman, women, had the same phenotype. So you can see that some of epigenetic information can be transmitted through meiosis, through gametes, even if it should not have to be transmitted. Uh, so we, here we come to transgenerational epigenetic inheritance and uh, th this means that we have an effect on phenotype which is not inherited through, uh, which, is not inheri uh, which is inherited through gametes but do not include changes in DNA sequence, that means mutation, and do not follow Mendelian rules. So you have a percentage it's not the Mendelian rules. Uh, and what is inherited? I said already these are DNA modification and histone modifications, but also you can inherit through gametes some little proteins like prions and small non-coding uh, DNAs. And this is a big issue in the epigenetic field today. It's very interesting and a um, lot of people are examining this for the moment. Uh, there are a lot of evidences that in sperm and oocytes there are many different classes of non-coding RNAs. Uh, long non-coding RNAs, microRNAs, endo, uh, small interfering RNAs, PV RNAs, etc. Uh, and uh, what is interesting that uh, they somehow give 
a gamut, a, a zygote, uh, information which is needed for the zygote to survive until two-stage phase, because at two-stage phase you have a, um, a start, uh, transcription is starting. So uh, zygote have some information encoded in these non-coding RNAs. Uh, also in C. elegans and in plants, there are evidences that uh, non-coding RNAs can uh, go uh, through one cell to another. For example, in plants you have a transcription of repetitive elements to non-coding RNAs from vegetative, uh, vegetative um, nuclei and then this is transported to the sperm and silence transposons and establish imprinting in sperm. It's very interesting. Uh, and here I come, Olga, what you, you, you asked me uh, <coughs> before 10 minutes. Um, so normally epigenetic uh, information is uh, erased uh, during production of gametes. Why? I just convinced you, because we don't want that epigenetic aberrant epigenetic modifications that we accumulated during our lives because of the environment to transmit to our babies. We ma they should be de novo. They should establish their epigenetic information correctly. So it is reprogrammed during uh, gametogenesis, in spermatogenesis. You see here one wave of reprogramming. Another wave in all uh, genesis is a little bit differently because uh, meiosis is completed just uh, before ovulation, so you have here epigenetic uh, reprogramming and another wave is after uh, fertilization in very early zygotic uh, uh, development. So you have uh, two waves of uh, repro reprogramming epigenetic. And it should go different ways for, you know, like female and male gametes, right? Mm -hmm. That's why people think that uh, maybe uh, women have a larger window for epigenetic modifications to be uh, transmitted through uh, gamete because it stay longer time um, demethylated. And how then can we transmit some modifications if there are two ways of epigenetic reprogramming? Yes, we can because you can imagine scenario where Okay, you have uh, two waves of reprogramming, but some, some loci escape it, just escape this reprogramming, this uh, black circus. And the uh, arrow, uh, you see this dash arrow showed that this is a very rare event. It's a much less than 100%, uh, uh, it's a very rare. We don't know how often is this uh, happening. Uh, we know for plants, we know for some animal models, but for people we don't know. But I think that it's much more often that we know for the moment. So in mice they showed that uh, around 100 promoters escape epigenetic reprogramming of the methylation marks. So this loci, a potential loci which can participate in a transgenerational inheritance and here we come to this uh, neo-Lamarckian concept or Lamarckian cause, concept who believed that uh, environmental can affect phenotype of uh, animals or, or humans. He was also uh, at that time neglected and uh, people were laughing at him but now it seems that he was not so wrong of course you must take, uh, he, he couldn't prove this at that time. He had also little bit crazy ideas, but his concept is now coming back to the scene with this epigenetic uh, uh, inheritance. Uh, so this is his famous story. But, you know, this story is may maybe, uh, um, maybe, uh, ridiculous, but today we have a very nice examples in animal world. Uh, there's examples of amphids uh, 
if uh, mothers are, are exposed to very crowded population, so there are years when the population is very crowded, they sense through pheromones, they have a signal to produce, um, to produce uh, progeny with wings. And if the population is not crowded, they produce progeny without wings. So you see, you see direct, direct influence of environment on the progeny, on the phenotype of the progeny. And there is a study of Walsh et co collaborators in 2010. They showed that some of the, uh, I forgot which genes, juvenile associated genes are differentially methylated and have a different gene activity level in heads of these amphids, uh, which are crowded and uh, with wings, and these which are uncrowded and unwinged. So they really linked this uh, environment phenotype relationship through mediated by environmental, uh, by epigenetic uh, uh, modifications. Uh, also, there is a very nice paper published in Nature Medicine. So it's really a uh, highly ranked uh, journal, which shown in mice, uh, if you have a liver damage, it can lead to heritable reprogramming of the hepatic wound healing in rat males. They showed, in fact, that uh, adapted rats show less generational liver myofibroblasts, higher hepatic expression of the PPRG gene, this gene, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, and TGF gene, compared to rats without adaptation. And they found in promoter of these genes uh, changed uh, histone modification, modifications and replacement of H3 histone to a histone variant H2AZ, which is a signal for gene activity. And this can persist over several generations. But even if such a things can persist over several generations, it cannot be substrate for, the, for evolution. Because if you need a substrate for evolution, then this should proceed through endlessly, you know, through generations. And we don't have any uh, experimental proof for this. Uh, there is a one paper done in C. elegans. Uh, they showed that small RNAs can change uh, um, gene expression level, uh, also as, as an adaptory mechanism through 100 generations, but it's still 100. It's not enough for, for, for to, to be a, a substrate for evolution. So there is a missing link. and. Uh, me and my postdoc, again, in this paper, propose a one speculatory, still speculatory mechanism, but can be. So if you have a stress, you see that you, if stress is permanent, you can change uh, methylation of cytosine. Unmethylated promoters can become methylated. 5-methylcytosine is a highly mutagenic nucleotide. I don't know if you knew this. But our genome uh, is uh, four to five times less methylated than it was in ancient times. Why? Because 5-methylcytosine is mutagenic. Uh, the most uh, frequent transition is from cytosine to uracil. This you should know. And it is repaired by, by uracil DNA glycosidase. But if you have a 5-methylcytosine, then it is uh, there is a transition, the amination of this nucleotide leads to timine. And there is no efficacy repairment of this transition. There is one protein, this is methyl binding protein, MBD4, which has glycosidase activity on his HH3 domain, but it's very inefficient. I don't know how many percentage it repairs, but it's not efficient. So if you have a lot of 5-methylcytosine in a genome, it's a, 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 
substrate for, uh, for, for a mutation. So, to go, go back to our hypothesis, if the stress is prolonged, if the change is permanent, if you have a 5-methylcytosine, it can go by deamination to timine and you have a fixed epigenetic change as a genetic change and this can be a subset for evolution. But I'm telling you this is just our uh, hypothesis which should be experimental proven, experimentally proven, but there is a lot of papers dealing with this idea. So, And I will just tell you that there is a lot of things that we learn about epigenetics in this uh, maybe how many uh, 55 years or something, 50 years, let's say, even less. But it's a still a tip of a huge iceberg. We don't know a lot of things in epigenetics and in biology uh, in general. Mm -hmm. And if you, you, you have attention for five more minutes, I will just uh, quickly show you uh, what we are working in my group. Okay? So we are dealing with epigenetic regulation of protein glycosylation. This is my group. I have um, three uh, young PhD students. She, will, she is just going to defend her uh, doctoral thesis. And I have uh, one, two, three, four, uh, three, he is left, three postdocs and uh, one assistant professor who, is joined, who joined our group. So, uh, this is all thanks to two uh, FP7 projects. I have also uh, some national foundation. And uh, we are linking epigenomics, epigenetics uh, gly uh, with glycomics. And you heard uh, Professor Louts the other day, he was talking to you about glycans, you remember? So uh, nearly 60% of all our proteins are glycosylated. And we believe that glycosylation, glycosylation is also very dynamic, very dynamic s system. And uh, there is a lot of variability because of the different glycosylation in individuals. And we suppose that uh, uh, this variability is caused by epigenetic change. So if glycans are very complex molecules composed of many sugar nucleotides, and if uh, every of this sugar will be put on a previous one by action of one, uh, another enzyme. And if you have a mut epigenetic change in any gene of, of these genes coding for these enzymes, you will end up with completely different glycan structure. So, so we are at the moment examining this. We have a very uh, several nice papers which shows that really epigenetic uh, regulation change uh, glycans. Uh, we are doing this on um, ce animal cell models. This is done on HeLa cells. We are also doing this on another cell, cell lines like uh, HEPG2 and etc. And uh, this, um, this paper shows we treated, uh, we treated cells with uh, epigenetic inhibitors. Then we measured glycans from a membrane of HeLa cells, analyzed methylation, make a correlation uh, analysis, and we see that some glycan groups were changed, etc. And what was very uh, nice, we showed that uh, before treatment, we have uh, one uh, glycan pattern on the cell membrane. After the epigenetic treatment, uh, the glycan pattern changed. But if we leave cells in drug-free medium for one or two days, we could restore the same glycosylation pattern that was before. And this tells in favor of a stable epigenetic regulation of uh, protein glycosylation, at least at cell, cell membrane glycom. And we are doing this on some other cellular um, cell lines, this is HEPG2, which corresponds to hepatocellular carcinoma cell lines. We are treating also these cells with epigenetic inhibitors, measuring glycans from secretome of these cells, and then measuring methylation and gene expression, correlating them, and see what is going on. Uh, we also, okay, 
uh, we, we are also involved in one project which are dealing with um, uh, diagnostic and prognostic markers for inflammatory bowel disease and here also we are involved with epigenetic regulation of protein glycosylation. We are doing this on IgG glycosylation. We shifted our research only on IgG as a single protein because in a secretome and uh, uh, for example cell membrane glycom you have a lot of proteins you don't know which one you are analyzing and here we shifted on just the one protein and uh, okay that's all.